So I'm going to give you a little overview of what I hope to talk about this evening and uh, present to, to all of you. So first of all, I want to talk about uh, the emotion disgust and indicate uh, that disgust is an, an important but under-recognized emotional state. Disgust is multidimensional multi in nature. It's critically involved in several psychopathological states, and there is some emerging evidence that it can be alleviated. And disgust may be partially responsible for the reluctance of therapists to adopt empirically based methods. <laughs> I'll get into that. Yeah, you laugh now, but I'm serious. Um, all right, so when I told people what my address was going to be about, they said, oh, so are you going to show like really disgusting, yucky pictures and all that kind of stuff? So let's get that out of the way now, okay? Uh, first, a dirty diaper, okay? Um, <clears throat> let that sink in for a second. And, um, and next, uh, a dirty bathroom. Now, I'm an OCD researcher, and so um, you can't quite tell, but the faucet has a really nasty water stain. So I'm indebted to my colleague in the English department at Fordham, Dr. Lenny Casuto, who is, who's alerted me to uh, an early uh, bit of writing about disgust by Jonathan Swift, the ladies' dressing room. Uh, it goes, and first a dirty smock appeared, beneath them armpits well, besmeared, Strephon the rogue displayed it wide, and turned it round on every side, on such a point few words are best. And Strephon bids us guess the rest, but swears how damnably the men lie in calling Celia sweet and cleanly. Now listen while he next produces the various combs for various uses, filled up with dirt so closely fixed no brush could force away betwixt a paste of composition rare, sweat, dandruff, powder, lead, and hair. Now, the way this story goes for poor Strephon is quite tragic. Uh, after he has now been snooping around uninvited in Celia's dressing room, Celia, who happens to be his girlfriend, he afterwards discovers a pot. Now, this is the time before indoor plumbing, and this pot was what uh, Celia used to defecate. And he discovers it filled with her uh, excrement. And after this, Strephon can think of nothing else when he's in the presence of Celia except for her, uh, the fact that she defecates. In fact, it extends beyond that to all women. And so we see in literature, Jonathan Swift portrayed for us the first sexual disorder that was based entirely on disgust. We're gonna come back to that. Um, disgust is also in movies and it's not restricted to horror movies and it's, there are examples in all genres. Uh, some illustrative examples. Uh, all the Indiana Jones movies use disgust to great effect with images of corpses, insects, and food. Uh, there's a famous scene uh, called the to that you can look up on YouTube, the toilet scene, in a movie called Nick and Nora's Infinite Play Playlist. It's quite disgusting, and it's the merging of food and bathroom experiences. Uh, pretty much the entire movie, The Aristocrats, uh, if you're not familiar with it, you have to brace yourself. Um, and the so-called protein bars in the recent film Snowpiercer um, here's a picture of uh, what a protein bar from that movie looks like. Uh, you learn a pretty dreadful secret about what they're composed of later in the film. I won't give it away, it's a great movie. Disgust is also evident in politics. There's some interesting research around this. Uh, the predisposition to experience disgust is associated with some much more conservative political attitudes. And the strongest relationship in this particular study I'm citing by Inbar et al. is for so-called purity-related issues. And so uh, these were defined, at least in this study, uh, for attitudes towards abortion or same-sex marriage. Uh, in another study, in a very large sample, this is impressively large for social science research across 120 countries, uh, discussed with and political ac uh, conservatism was strongly related with concerns over contamination uh, provoking the most conservative attitudes. Going further with class politics, George Orwell, who he, in his writings, really was trying to defend uh, all classes, observed why social hierarchies might get maintained. And he says, the real reason why European of bourgeois upbringing, even when he calls himself a communist, cannot with heart, without hard effort think of a working man as his equal. It is summed up in four frightful words, the lower classes smell. So let's get to the basic definition. The early definition of disgust that was formally given to us was by Darwin who said disgust refers to something revolting primarily in relation to the sense of taste as actually perceived or vividly imagined and secondarily to anything which causes a similar feeling through the sense of smell, touch, and even of eyesight. 
So some characteristics, let's break it down a little further and bring us up to date. So first of all, it was clearly evolved to protect from ingesting harmful foods or products. It's primarily a gustatory response. Uh, it extends outward to smell, sight, touch, and sound. And Gile gave us a more general definition when he defined disgust as revulsion at the prospect of oral incorporation of an offensive object. I want you to kind of hang on to that one also. It's coming back to us in a little bit. It's associated with some very specific physically observable reactions. Uh, they are a well-validated set of psychophysiological responses, including muscle tension in the upper lip and nostrils. This uh, very lovely portrait, uh, this, by the way, this uh, is available um, on Flickr, free to download. The, uh, the parents of this child really must not like her. Um, so, um, but this is, uh, this is a very good illustrative face for disgust. Actually, John also showed, I think, my own very good illustrative face for disgust. Um, it's also associated with lowered respiration, heart rate, and blood pressure. So there's a primarily parasympathetic uh, association with this emotional state. So let's go through, disgust is broken into elicitors. So I'd like to kind of overview, give you an overview of these elicitors. Uh, there's food. The food is kind of culturally determined. I'm assuming that no one in this audience is rushing out to the 7-Eleven to buy barbecue flavor silkworm pupae. Um, so this audience would probably find that to be particularly unappealing, but uh, that's a culturally determined aspect of food disgust. Insects and animals, body products. Here's someone who's uh, searching for. Uh, death, images associated with death tend to elicit disgust. Sex, now these are, uh, this is a mixed family kind of audience, so this, uh, I was a little bit put off by these banana slugs copulating, um, but images of sex tend to elicit disgust reactions. And body envelope violations, which refer to any time that you're exposed to images associated with the internal viscera, uh, organs, uh, mutilated body parts. So uh, this guy who is about to get uh, some surgery is illustrative of how we might experience body envelope violations. There's a there's a feature that governs all the components of these elicitors that's important for us to be familiar with. Disgust is an emotion that can be communicated. It's a communicable emotional state. And sympathetic magic is the part that gives it that communicable quality. And it comes in two major laws. So first of all, the, first, uh, the law of similarity. This refers to when an object takes the shape of something that we would determine to be disgusting. If it looks like very, very closely to something that we consider disgusting, we would be disgusted by it. So after this talk, nobody will look at a baby Ruth bar quite the same way. Um, it does bear a striking similarity to something. Um, and then there's the law of contagion. The law of contagion can be summed up by like a catchphrase, uh, once in contact, always in contact. Um, there's an interesting quote that I unearthed around this. Contact with the disgusting makes one disgusting. To study disgust is to risk contamination. Jokes about his or her unwholesome interests soon greet the disgust researcher. Um, I'll leave it to you guys to tell me after the talk as to whether or not this quote has legs. Okay, um, disgust still is quite a neglected emotional state. Uh, in 1998, Phillips et al. noted that disgust probably has some real relevance for psychopathology, but they noted that people were really not taking this seriously. They were not investigating it with much rigor, and so the research base in 1998 was pretty limited. Uh, Bumi and I, uh, in 2007, extended this, and we talked about the specificity of disgust as it applies to different emotional states, uh, to different psychopathological states. Uh, but we also noted that while, encouragingly, the research on this was increasing, it was still lagging quite far behind. Let me illustrate just how much so. So this is a simple search where we put in the word disgust and just looked at it stratified by year from 1987 up till uh, last year. Now 1987 is sort of a critical year. That was the year that a uh, major theoretical article regarding disgust was published in the journal Psychological Review by uh, Rosen and Fallon. So the current state of the research shows that interest has increased, as you can see from this line, but it still lags far behind other emotional states, as this graph illustrates. We did the same search method, but we used two other admittedly understudied emotional states, happiness and anger. And you'll see that those two emotional states far and away beat disgust as far as the number of abstracts that appear where those words are referenced in, uh, in relation to the study. So this is excuse me, an emotional state that really warrants 
additional investigation. And you'll see why in a moment. There's some very good reasons why I believe that. So the domains of disgust, I mentioned those seven elicitors. They can be broken down into uh, broader categories. So the first one, uh, food, body products, and animals, they all load on a factor referred to as core disgust. Core disgust is something that is viscerally disgusting. There is not a lot of time to think about it. It just immediately provokes a, a response. So uh, rotting food would fall in that category uh, or exposure to odors associated with different body prots, pro uh, products, certain animals. The aforementioned body envelope violations and death are in the category of what we call animal reminder disgust. So these are things that remind us of our connection to nature and to animal uh, experiences. Sympathetic magic and sex fall in the category of contamination. Uh, I think that's somewhat self-explanatory. And so this uh, slide is adapted from two different uh, bits of research, one from Bumi, and then it was followed up with a, uh, a replication with a great deal of data that contributed to this that we found the same factor structure. So these domains have some specificity. Uh, in, in a series of studies, we, we found that uh, it is associated with some specific correlates of personality, so core disgust is particularly associated with neuroticism, openness to experience, and a measure of self-esteem. Animal reminder uh, disgust is associated with neuroticism and behavioral inhibition. Contamination disgust is associated with neuroticism and also behavioral inhibition. In behavioral tasks, in a series of, series of video provocations that were intended to target each of those domains, and with a behavioral task called the grape spit task, uh, which entailed having participants take a grape, chew it up, spit it into a cup, and then consume it again. It's their own grape. <laughs> uh, so as a way of kind of validating the degree that these different behavioral tasks are associated with each of the core domain, uh, each of the domains, we see that each one does match up core with core, animal reminder with animal reminder, contamination with contamination. But we find some cross loadings uh, where core disgust and each of these behavioral tasks also are associated with animal reminder and the grape spit task, which seems to only really provoke core disgust. So it isolates that, uh, whereas the other two have, uh, well, uh, contamination also has an association with core disgust. And then in the psychophysiological range, also we find some specificity where there's greater association with uh, some of the different psychophysiological correlates of this uh, emotional state. So now the question goes to what is the role that disgust might play in psychopathology? So this really got started in 1991. A really very important study in the history of the dis relationship of disgust to psychopathology comes to us from Matchett and Davey, who observed that different phobias tend to be associated with, uh, some of them are associated with what we call a disease avoidance model, that those phobic experiences like with spiders, that in addition to maybe a fear component, that also respondents are disgusted by them because they have some association with disease. <clears throat> Oten, Stevenson, and Case went further and they looked at the uh, hypotheses that have emerged around what you would expect from the disease avoidance model. And here's a little summary of what they examined. So uh, the disease avoidance model would tell us that uh, we would expect a, a correspondence between the elicitors of disgust and disease. And so let's say spiders tend to actually be a little bit more associated with disease. Different things that evoke a disease avoidance reaction, those things do actually, in fact, have a greater risk of disease. Uh, so that's a very strong association. That violation of these disease-related cultural norms, so each culture has certain standards around how we respond to these disgust elicitors, that if you violate those, that also will lead to a disgust reaction as it pertains to your home cultural experience. And that has a moderate level of support. So it seems there's some decent support for it. Uh, it's not quite as strong as we see for the first one. The source of the elicitor evokes disgust. Uh, so that's like kind of where they live, where they come from. So spiders uh, tend to hang out in places that are dark, dank, not very pleasant, and that uh, that could elicit disgust in and of itself. Again, moderate support, not, not overwhelming, but definitely pretty good. And that the dust, disgust evoking cues can contaminate other objects. And that's the once in contact, always in contact uh, example that I gave you earlier. So extensions, let's look at how this plays out with some specific disorders. So first of all, in contamination fear, um, there's marked avoidance due to sympathetic magic, both the law of similarity and contagion. So people who have contamination fear tend to be fearful of things that are uh, according to the laws of uh, sympathetic magic. 
Research has shown it to be unmediated by anxiety. When we first started doing this work, a question that was frequently asked is, well, how do you know that participants aren't just mislabeling the experience and it's just anxiety and there's some kind of arousal and they're calling it anxiety? Uh, and so we've found that th that is in fact not the case, that uh, in mediation tests, the better ones are where uh, disgust is a direct link between contamination and fear. And that experimental sh tests show that there is a persistence of perceived contamination. In uh, this particularly nice ex uh, experiment that Tolan's group did, Dave Tolan's group did, they took uh, individuals with OCD, compared them to individuals with other anxiety disorders and non-anxious controls, and they found that if they took pencils and had them in contact with a contaminant, and then they said, okay, how contaminated is this pencil? And so you'll see that, generally speaking, everybody had some contamination rating to it. Uh, then they would take that pencil and put it in contact with a different pencil. And so now that pencil that's once removed how contaminated is this? And so the people who are contamination fearful continue to rate it as pretty contaminated. Now you take that once removed pencil, touch it to another one, okay, now it's twice removed, still provokes contamination response. And you can see that they go all the way out to 12 pencils. So 12th removed pencil is still being identified as being pretty contaminated by people who are contamination fearful, whereas the other groups it's dropped down to zero. So it has some very specific association for contamination fear versus the control a threat non-relevant stimuli, basically nothing. The degree that it's in contact after being contaminated is virtually negligible. The disease avoidance model has implications for blood injury and injection phobia. So individuals with BII phobia show greater aversion to surgically relevant stimuli in some behavioral avoidance tests. So that's a nice finding to see that supports this model and that individuals with BII phobia show higher discuss related thoughts following a surgery video. It's been examined in sexual dysfunction. Uh, sexual dysfunction, the hypothesized model is that uh, disgust reactions are overridden by arousal during uh, sexual experiences. And when those get reversed, then that's a formula for uh, some sexual dysfunction. So you remember poor Strefan? Earlier, Strefan illustrates very nicely this model that was outlined for us by, by Peter de Jong and his group uh, a, a couple of years ago. Moral disgust is also one that we should really think about because moral reactions, things that are violations of our moral standards, tend to provoke reactions that are not inconsistent with how we would react if we were exposed to a contaminant. Uh, so these moral transgressions evoke pretty strong disgust responses. And there are several experiments that have illustrated this particularly well. If you're interested, there's a really very nice and very thorough review of this in Chapman and Anderson, but I'll give you one example that's particularly illustrative of this effect. So in this particular study by Zhang and Lundquist, they had people uh, hand copy ethical or unethical stories. And then after they were done with that, they gave them an opportunity, like how desirable would it be to use a cleaning product? And also how desirable, how desirable would it be for other products? Uh, and the other products were things like Snickers bars and uh, batteries and things that were really not in any way related to cleaning yourself. And you'll see that the people who copied an unethical story were much more likely to find desirable a cleaning product versus the fairly equivocal relationship between the desirability of those things uh, when they wrote an ethical story. So can disgust be treated? Well, it turns out exposure treatment has been employed. There's some benefit to it. Uh, but the research seems to suggest that the outcomes when you do exposure for disgust, it has a little bit of a slower outcome than if it's for anxiety reactions. So example one, uh, in a sample of spider fearful participants, undergraduates who had particularly high spider fear, their disgust reactions went more slowly uh, down compared to anxiety in an exposure task, 30 minute exposure task. The same effect was observed in individuals, a college sample who had uh, blood injection injury phobia. Now what's notable about this is that in both of these examples, the phobic disgust reaction was related to the fear decline. So we have two major things going on here. One, anxiety declines more rapidly than the disgust reaction, but it is mediated by the level of their baseline disgust reaction. So disgust is actually pretty important for us to think about if we wanna really accomplish more thorough reduction of avoidance due to different phobic experiences. In the example of contamination fear, we sort of see the same thing. So here's a sample where um, there was, uh, I'm, I, you know what, my slides are a little bit messed up here. The graph was not supposed to come up first. Uh, so as with other phobias, the decline in disgust was slower than for fear. And so there's some interesting research around that in contamination fear. Uh, and that it may be a function of type of contamination concern. For example, non-illness-based contamination 
was uh, showing slower habituation. Now, in this particular set of graphs, uh, people with OCD where it was pri primarily contamination-based versus people who had OCD non-contamination-based, you'll see that their discussed experience went down more slow, uh, went down pretty slowly compared to their fear uh, experiences. Now, the other OCD participants also had a slower rate of decline. We have kind of a level effect here. So we're seeing that disgust goes down more slowly. It happens to be particularly relevant for contamination fear. So a little interim summary for us. First of all, disgust is an important but vastly understudied emotional state. It's multidimensional in nature with specific self-report behavioral and psychophysiological response patterns. There's increasing support shown for a role for disgust in psychopathology. And treatment approaches to alleviate disgust are still in the nation stage of development. Now, that background uh, leads us now to how could this play a role in some other uh, problems like what I mentioned at the beginning, that this may be implicated in our dissemination efforts and problems in disseminating CBT. So I want to give a little bit of background on the research that would lead directly to that, but knowing about disgust is important as background for that. So disgust and issuing judgments. There's a really great research on this that we can find in the social psychology literature. So it's been found that experiencing disgust has been shown to lead to much harsher, harsher moral judgments. Through odor provocation, I have a metaphorical picture for you to kind of gnaw on. That gives you a sense of the stimuli. I'm just kind of read it, digest it for a minute. Uh, in the presence of visually disgusting stimuli, by recollection of a physically disgusting experience, and by video provocation. And in all four of these experiments, the moral judgments were particularly harsh for individuals, uh, by individuals, uh, who had greater sensitivity to their own bodily sensations. So if you were inclined to really notice your physical reactions to different experiences, then you were really going to issue harsher moral judgments. You were more in tune to the fact that you were uh, experiencing some disgust. So now this brings us to cultural norm violations, worldview threats, and disgust. How do those things fit together? So if you engage in a willful violation of cultural norms, that will evoke a disgust reaction in you. Um, and as one sense of agency increases, so in other words, the degree that you feel confident in your ability to adhere to your own naturally occurring worldview, when you violate it, your disgust reaction is more extreme. So the way this went in this particular experiment that I'm, uh, that I'm citing is they had people read stories that violated their own cultural worldview, but where they placed themselves in it. So they had to imagine themselves in the context of violating a personal worldview, and their disgust reactions were particularly intense under those conditions. Worldview threat also increases disgust reactions. So when you are in the presence of a worldview threat, uh, that also will increase your disgust reaction. But if there's a way that you can remove the emotional component, then that will alleviate the degree that you'll feel a threat to your worldview. Uh, so this was also demonstrated very recently in a nice paper that's in press that showed uh, these uh, illustrations where people were exposed to these kind of threats and then when, it was when the emotional component was removed, then, uh, then there was more acceptance of the kind of challenge to their worldview. So this brings us, uh, now hold on to that for a moment because we're going to come back to that. There's a popularity of non-empirical therapies that I want us to consider. So first of all, while we know that there are some promising efforts underway, many of them led by ABCT, and there are other agencies at the state level and, and national level that are trying to encourage dissemination and empirical uh, and imp implementation of empirically based approaches, it still remains problematic. There are some challenges uh, around that. Uh, many of the available therapies that people seek out or are trained in do not emphasize empirical bases for intervention selection. So let's go through a few examples, but this is not in any way an exhaustive list. Uh, existential psychotherapy is taught at 128 institutions in 42 countries. Continuing education programs for non-empirically supported approaches proliferate. Uh, I should take a drink then. Ah, that's so refreshing. Um, and the American Psychoanalytic Association lists 31 training inst institutes across the United States. And empirically supported treatments then, we could say, violate the worldview of non-empirical therapists, right? If you are seeking this out regularly, you probably have a worldview that is non-empirical. So let's engage in a brief thought experiment. Join me for a second. Imagine that it emerged in the, emerges in the near future that energy therapy, such as meridian tapping, was found most efficacious for, uh, for treating depression, demonstrated in several randomized control trials, which were in turn accepted by a wide range of leading non-CBT scholars. Would this audience readily accept and integrate this approach into research and everyday practice? 
So there's a theory that exists already to help us in bridging this gap between what we know about disgust, what we know about worldview threats and identity threats, and disgust, and it's terror management theory. So here's the basic tenet of terror management theory. If you're not familiar with it, there's an extensive social psychology literature on this that I've been finding very fascinating for the last couple of years. So it has two things, proximal threats to identity, such as learning empirically supported treatments when you self-identify as other than empirical, is dangerous to one's survival. Distal threats, such as a non-empirical therapist attending a CBT workshop for CE credit, is also threatening, but not anywhere near as bad. And so violations of aspects of identity lead to negative reactions, including disgust directed at, <coughs> disgust directed at the responsible source. So I'll give you a few examples so you can think about this a little bit more fully. Uh, from our side of it, empirical therapists, a proximal threat would be if you were required to apply clearly unsupported or questionable approaches to clients with known where, for whom known empirical approaches exist, such as psychoanalysis for contamination fear. A distal threat might be if you catch yourself favorably quoting results from a Rorschach assessment that didn't use a scoring method. For non-empirical therapists, then, a proximal threat would be required, being required to utilize a manual with recorded sessions as evidence of adherence to the protocol, whereas a distal threat might be listing an empirical approach as one of the services provided along with a panoply of other non-empirical ones. So you're just putting it there and you're happening to do a bunch of other things. So this brings us to sort of the nesting of how we might experience this. So uh, if we live in a milieu where there's a prevailing anti-science uh, anti cultural perspective, that's sort of the outer ridge, then within that you're a member of a non-empirical therapeutic community which holds an anti-science worldview, and you also have faulty assumptions about the science-based practice, and then you are presented by somebody coming in saying, I have a strong endorsement for empirically-based practices. Well, then we start to pierce all the way through to here to their faulty assumptions, and you're going through these other two levels in which it's nested. And that leads to a disgust reaction and a rejection of the practice principles. So this leads to what I think might be a reasonable dissemination agenda for us, uh, and it's through avoidance of identity and worldview threat. First of all, this is going to seem a little outrageous. Uh, we might actually consider de-emphasizing data and emphasize the improvement of the human condition. Highlight the consistency of empirically supported treatments with the clinician's worldview, such as the improvement of human experience. And yoke training and empirically supported treatments with illustrative case data. Diane Chambliss and, uh, and her uh, postdoc uh, Stewart found that this was a way to find uh, non-empirically oriented therapists found uh, empirically based treatments much more acceptable when there was illustrative case data. And be ready with scientific supports for claims of efficacy. Now, let me just emphasize, this agenda that I'm recommending is if you are speaking to a non-empirical audience. So it does not apply here. You come to ABCT, bring your data. Um, so Upton Sinclair, after he wrote The Jungle, noted that he was surprised at the reaction after he exposed the deplorable conditions at Chicago's meatpacking plants. And he had said in an interview, I aimed at the public's heart, and by accident, I hit it in the stomach. Our charge, then, in a little take on Upton Sinclair in disseminating treatments to non-empirical therapists is to avoid the therapist's stomach and aim directly for the heart. So let me give you my broad conclusions. Increasingly, research has demonstrated a functionally central connection between disgust and psychopathology. A need remains clearly to demonstrate the public health significance of interventions to alleviate pathological disgust. And I think I spelled that out when I emphasized the role that disgust might have in a number of different anxiety and uh, other problems. Discussed reactions by clinicians due to identity threat when faced with pressure to provide empirically supported treatment interferes with the dissemination of more effective therapies. And finally, the methods for improving dissemination that I've described here have been hypothesized, but they're as yet untested. So I'm really presenting for us a model that I'm hoping will inspire further evaluation. Okay, so no talk like this is complete without some thank yous. Um, where would I be? Uh, to stand at this podium would not be possible without my students, both past and present. There are really too many of them. There are a lot of them in this audience, and I'm sorry, I'm not going to name all of you, uh, but I really do appreciate all that you've done for me over the years. Uh, I've had numerous colleagues and collaborators over the years, uh, really incredible experience to get to this point. Um, and also, before I get to my last one, uh, I want to just remark how I've been so honored by the opportunity to serve this organization this year as your president. And thank you for trusting me with, uh, with our, our, our really in great organization that's meant so much to me this year. And finally, most importantly, uh, I really want to thank my wonderful wife, Dawn, and our beautiful daughter, Rebecca. Uh, 
they both make me laugh hysterically all the time, and so uh, that helps things tremendously. And, and really, my wife has been so supportive and has been here uh, with me through, through and through since the beginning. So really, thank you guys. Thank you.